Welcome to the Great Base Tennis Podcast. I'm Steve Smith along with Phil Ritchie, number 104. Phil, tell, us, list, tell our listeners uh, what role, what capacity you've had with us this summer. Uh, this summer, I've, uh, I'm the intern here. The or, intern. Uh, the intern. That's for sure, the uh, intern. The past six weeks. Uh, when I first came, I originally was here to play for six weeks, and you offered me the internship. Yeah, I know Roberto Cow spoke to you as well. Now it's 12 weeks. Um, I once read, if you can survive an overnight tennis camp, you can survive the tennis industry. And I think if summer has gone by, if you were to take uh, 13 weeks, there's been times where we've gone to Subway 91 days in a row. Uh, share some of the uh, tasks that you had to complete as an intern. Oh, there are so many. Uh from organization to video work, um, you know, picking up kids from the airport. Uh, the biggest of them was the video work. A lot of time was spent behind the camera and the computer screen, uh, you know, producing film, editing film. And that's so important to what we do here. And um, I like to think I did a pretty good job. You did a great job. Pretty good means pretty bad. You don't want to think that you oh, did. I did a great job. There, there, you, there you go. There you go. From New Jersey, two types of people: those from New, <coughs> those from New Jersey and those that wish they were. Uh, you survived some verbal abuse. That was good. I think that's uh, locker room one hundred and one. Coach, uh, you're I, too easy on me towards the end. I think the tennis uh, children don't spend enough time in a locker room. Phil is a triplet. He's one of three. The first time he came to work with us was. Uh, we were at uh, Tennis Memphis, a nonprofit organization. You, your two brothers, and a teammate, right? The fourth, yeah, fourth Mike teammate. Yeah, Mike was our other teammate. The New Jersey boys. What's it like being a triplet? Uh, it's pretty cool. You know, uh, being here over the summer, there's definitely a lot of only uh, single, child, single kids. Uh, you know, so... I like to think I'm lucky to have two brothers do things with always, practice with. Yes, an only child doesn't mean a lonely child, but families are smaller. So there are there have been a number of children that um, one or two kids in the family, for sure. That's very common. With uh, Yeah, so I started talking about tasks with, you know, every player coming in, skill testing, 25 shots, designated targets, a tiebreaker test. <laughs> hitting six consecutive shots to designate targets. And many, many kids are 0707, but we set up that written file and the video file, film essential strokes, three different angles, film point play, then we have to make narrated slow motion analysis. Uh, with uh, It's not a simple task. It's definitely labor, labor intensive, but if people do that in the beginning, we always say there's no substitute for a good beginning. With um, follow, you know, the follow-up, our students sending notes. You know, then do they study content? Uh, tell, the, tell the listeners um, where you are right now. You're going to be a junior in college, correct? Playing, playing college tennis. Where you go to school? What you're studying? Yes, I'm, a, I'm going to my junior year of college at DeSales University. And I'm a double major in finance and accounting. Say that again, a double major in? Finance and accounting. I was once told by an accountant that perfection is the minimum standard. I ran a program where you get a two-year degree, and it was very, very difficult for students to pass the accounting classes. We did have one professor eventually who um, had it set up where it was as if the students had their own business. They're keeping inventory for a pro shop and... That made a little bit more sense. Um, and actually, one of the classes was, was non-transferable. So I know they say at the at the university level, the program I ran was a two-year program, junior college. But at the university level, the kind of the make it or break it, if you're going to get into business school, you got to do well in the county. CPA. Yeah, well, this uh, this internship last uh, over the summer has definitely um, prepared me for you know Wall Street, as you like to put it. Oh, I, that's flattering. But uh, I tell people I've done this at, at parties where someone says, "Oh, I'm, you know, CPA," and I, they say, "I used to be a, um, a PLA." And 
I go, what do you mean a PL? Some, most people don't even ask. I go, parking lot attendant. I was a perennial tennis bum at Boca Raton, and I paid, paid my way by, uh, which I think allowed me to do so many different things. Uh, I wasn't teaching tennis right away. I was studying to teach tennis, but I was a PLA, a parking lot attendant. With being an intern, you know, I think people can be a hobby coach. You're just coaching family, friends for fun. Supplemental coach, part-time coach, or you can do it on a full-time basis. The, um, what are your thoughts about the tennis industry? I know that you spent time with Mark Spann, correct? Correct. Marky baby, uh, he, he went to our two-year program. Now he, um, he's part owner of a club in Philadelphia, which is your part of New Jersey, closer to Philly than New York, right? Yeah. So what do you think about the tennis industry? Do um, you think you'd ever want to pursue tennis as I would, career? and this summer has opened up the doors for me, I'd say. And one thing that would be important to me is finding someone or a group of kids who really want to learn. You know, uh, you know I, that'd be the most important thing. You know, I wouldn't want to coach somebody or teach somebody that, you know, gets dropped off by their parent after school and just passing the time by. Well, but on the other it's hand... important for passion. Yeah. No, it's true. But on the other hand, uh, you know, you can take that one kid who's coming once a week and, and, and hopefully they get connected with tennis. So you, yeah. you never know where, where or when that, that switch is going to go on. Um, with, from a learning standpoint, um, it's, it's said that the only bad thing about the people business is people. What do you think overall of uh, the work ethic of the children that you've met? I mean, you have to give them a pat on the back for dealing with the Florida heat and humidity. Well, everyone here, for the most part, really wants to be here. You know, they don't have to come here. And if tennis is important to them, they'll be here. So for all the kids that I've worked with this summer, uh, they're very intense. And they have a passion for tennis, which I love to see that. With, it is a pretty captive audience. We, we don't advertise, and the people that end up here... Generally, it's a, a former student who's recommended they come. And they do come in with the idea that they've got to go back to the drawing board. But, but you've met from really A to Z. I mean, you've met um, as young as six have come a long ways. Um, you know, we, we teach a lifestyle. We teach a, a pathway from six to <clears throat> players that are already playing college tennis. <clears throat> but we find a way to have them all work together too. With um, what are your thoughts, as far as um, just a few experiences, if you were to uh, reflect upon? Well, this summer I've met all types of people from all parts of the globe. You know, Canada, Europe. Uh, the, you know, the group from Denmark is here now, and um, Team Denmark. You know, I think that's very cool. You know, I'm able to be here, meet all these people from all over. You know, it opens up your eyes to the world. Yeah, and you can stay in touch with people today. Years ago, it was like, yeah, I'll see you. And I remember when I graduated from boarding school, my father said, do you have everybody's phone number? And of course, you can go through the, uh, the alumni office and get in touch with people. But now it, <clears throat> it's just a different world with, um, with technology. Um, expectations, disappointments. Um, one thing so far though, is that you haven't heard back, neither you nor me have heard from that many people about the notes, correct? No, I haven't received any notes. And, you know, school is going to be starting up and we ask people to watch the tape three times, send us notes. Uh, we ask people to follow all these routines. We have uh, five courses online. We tell people if they were just to watch Great Base Initiative, I think it's 17, four or five minute clips, and then the course on how to practice at home. Um, <clears throat> yeah, we do have our line when, <clears throat> when people leave. The, the operation was a success, but the patient leave. And, uh, excuse me, why do you say that for me? The operation was a su success, but the patient died. Yes, perhaps the patient will die if they don't practice. <clears throat> With um, the, the pre-post, you know, we've, 
have intentions to do a much better job getting out content, but the improvement that players show on the film is very, very impressive. But they have to go home and they have to practice routines because the, the athlete's a biocomputer and they'll, they'll just um, they'll just revert back. Yeah, even after uh, we had a kid here for three <clears throat> weeks and his, um, his improvement is very impressive and it's great how he took it all home and now he's doing video work and teaching kids at his club. Oh, and helping out, yeah, helping out his, his, his local pro. That's amazing. Yeah, teaching is information transfer, but amazing attitude. Amazing, amazing attitude. Great student. And I think one thing, too, is the compatibility factor. Is um, I think it's great where we take kids to tournaments, uh, say, for example, the famous Battle of Boca, and there's a lot of advanced players, as high as you know, 13, perhaps even 14 on the, on the UTR, taking kids to go and chart matches and... So I think creating a community, creating a culture. Um, There's so much learning done at that tournament for us that I see, you know, whether it be charting or for me, I like watching the lessons that were done and, um, you know, watching the other matches going on, you know, and just analyzing the strokes, analyzing how they move. We always say that the coach can choose their captains, but they can't choose their leaders. Tell us a little bit about your team situation. I mean, it must have been interesting to play high school tennis with uh, yeah, three the triplets in the lineup. Yeah, so I'll start with high school then. Uh, I got my hoodie on. Um, yeah, so my junior year, we made it to the uh, state finals. I lost 3-2. There's uh, some Jersey boys here that they know of uh, the same teams that we play. And, uh, you know, uh, joke back and forth. But we made it to the state finals and lost uh, to Del Barton. And the kid that played number one, he was a freshman on their team, but he was just in the uh, Wimbledon uh, boys' final, Michael Zang. And the year before, there was a New Jersey, Jersey boy. And the, he won junior Wimbledon. I should be able to tell you his name. He uh, Samir. I can't think of the last name. Samir Jamboree. He I'll was going to go name. to Columbia, but now he's made a change. He's going to go to Stanford. Well, yeah, that was high school. And then um, our senior year season in high school got cut because of COVID. You know, uh, we had our first practice and then a second practice. And then after that, school closed down. And that was the end of the season. And that's really when I started studying the information online. Uh, it gave me time to do it. And. I just wanted to improve my tennis. No, I was impressed when you got here that you had a very good technical base other than uh, not being loose enough and low enough on the forehand side. Tell, tell us the high school. I went to a Catholic school. Catholic high school, uh, St. Augustine Prep. Um, you know, the priest taught us there. You know, we, every year we had a theology class. Yeah, that, was, that was very tough. Um, all boys, so... It's tough, you know, tough love there. I went to Catholic school and I started off. I have a son who graduated from a Jesuit school. The Jesuits just give us the first seven years. But your school is run by? Uh, my high school is Augustinian priests. And then you go to a Catholic high school as well? Uh, Catholic, Catholic college. Catholic college, yep. They're, uh, uh, it's DeSales University, and uh, it's under the teachings of St. Francis DeSales, so the Oblates. I need to do some homework. Sydney McLaughlin. New Jersey. New Jersey. What an athlete she is. And what about all the sports? You're just, you, just, you and your brothers just played uh, tennis? No, we did a wide range of sports. Uh, growing up, we played a lot of soccer, played rec soccer, travel soccer, uh, a little bit of everything, basketball. I did martial arts for a long time. And we actually did roller skating uh, uh, twice a week. My grandparents would bring us, or I think we did it four years up until high school. It was pretty cool. I have to get this in with the verbal abuse. I said, Gee, you know, you're a triplet. Your mother must have uh, had all three of you in her arms at one time, and, and she must have dropped you on your head. <laughs> and you said, yes, she did. <laughs> I thought that was uh, worth, worth a chuckle. 
with um, Phil. Phil. There's a, a scene from uh, Eddie, Hills Mur Cop. Eddie, Mur Eddie Murphy, Beverly Hills Cop, and I used to just go, Phil, is that you, Phil? And then uh, I think he asked me where that came from, and I said, well, let's look it up. Or maybe you knew. I did know. <laughs> the Beverly Hills Cop. With, um, there's been people that have gone before you, and I think it was great that, uh, you know, Roberto and I discussed it, and you said, yeah, okay, I'll stay for uh, six more weeks. But the, but you had an internship lined up that, that didn't work out, right? So there, that was a good, this was a good substitute. Yeah, I like to think everything happens for a reason, and it fell through, and you offered me a chance to stay here. Um, it worked out for the better. Well, you know, one thing is uh, people have gone before you 24-7. You know, we pretty much work like they do in the NFL. With, um, I don't really think of it as work, but it's uh, in the summertime. You know, I could touch upon how we have plans to do it differently next summer. But the way it's been set up for several years now, I hate to even mention it, but Nine, during 9-11, um, like a lot of people, um, you know, their world was affected. I don't, again, don't even like to mention it, but I had, at that time, I had people coming from overseas, parents, players, and staying in hotels. But when 9-11 happened, everyone stopped traveling, and that's where I started doing this on an individual basis, just small, you know, small pockets of people coming in with, but we... Um, it's not, a, it, I tell people, it's really not a traditional tennis camp. It's not like you start Monday morning and we have people, you know, three across the baseline hitting forehands. You pretty much, the way it's been set up, and it's, 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 it's a year round. It's not just like, well, we just do it in the summer. It does vary in the summer because uh, we have, during the school year, basically just students that are homeschooled. You know, they, you know, kids can, there's three times they can come, uh, during a holiday break, they can come during summer vacation, and then obviously, obviously school year. So school year, summer break, and then holidays. So during the summer, we have some kids that, you know, we would say, okay, they're summer, they're true summer students. But it's not, for us, it's not a summer camp. In other words, um, we let people come and go as they please. We, rec we recommend yeah, they really should be here for three weeks. You know, sometimes that's difficult to do, but one week is just not enough. One week is just not enough. And I do also think that it's a very good thing. I recommend that now. I mean, there's always a, a two sides to every situation, a positive and negative, but I think it's best for the player to come with their parent the first time. You know, I always tell, you know, two heads are better than one, and the, the child doesn't have wisdom. Wisdom is knowledge with time. With uh, what else you got? Tell us about your internship, apprenticeship. Um, yeah, I, I thought it was really cool going to the different tournament sites with you. Uh, we had the National Clay Tournament, uh, meeting all the coaches there from Florida, uh, Texas, Indiana. Uh, Jeremy spent a couple days with us. I thought that was really neat. Yeah, Jeremy Wurtzman came in. Uh, he was a guest on the podcast. Uh, there was quite a few people here for the national um, 16s and 18s. The 12 year old girls were here as well. So there was, you know, I, easily we had um, you know, 15 people, maybe, maybe as many as 20, um, and in those three events, the 18 clays, 16 clays, boys, and then girls. You know, this week, uh, you know, we had students who left today that are off to play the hard courts with, um, yeah, so you get, I think it's getting to meet a lot of people, but I think really in the end, it circles back that the messages are always the same. You know, whether someone's a beginner or someone's a college tennis player. Uh, it's amazing with uh, the connections. Um, you know, the tennis channel yesterday, uh, Max Cressy was playing Jack Sock. And I think of uh, Jack Sock. I mean, I believe he won 82 matches in a row, played high school tennis all four years. 
and my son Connor was at Kalamazoo, and I was sharing some advice with Connor and his friend Gonzalez Austin, Austin Gonzalez. It's Gonzalez Austin, very good tennis player. I believe he played at Vanderbilt, and he beat Jack Sock in the 16s, and made Jack move to his right. He, a lot of players, they just want to move to his left. Of course, you know, he, it's not, he's not in the 16s anymore, but the toss was way over his head. He had too much kick you know, in, in the juniors. But, you know, he's playing Max Cressy. I know Max Cressy spent time with Matt Clore, Andy Fitzell, actually with our place. J.J. Wolf um, had a great win with uh, Dennis Shapovalov. And I know Andy um, Fitzell, I was there. It was in, at Columbus, the Ohio State backyard, and he had a palm up serve. So the, the connections, uh, there are just so many different things. I check my phone where we need to do a better job. We're, we're not one to uh, you know, um, even use people's last names or put photos of people winning trophies on, on a website. But yeah, a couple of boys playing for Northern Cal uh, in the team team event before Kalamazoo, they actually uh, beat Southern Cal. So any time if someone from Northern Cal could beat someone from Southern Cal, it's just I think you know a lot of it's just purely a numbers game. But the history of Southern Cal tennis has been stronger than Northern Cal. But though the the results, um, you know, how's it go? The proof's in the pudding. If you chop wood all day, you'll have a pile of, pile of wood. I met a few of those guys this summer. Yeah, I mean, uh, yeah. Again, staying away from names, but Alex Fuchs, uh, that guy is just bombing his serve, like ba boom. I mean, it was you know, it was, it was very good for him at the National Clays, where so many coaches were um, just raving about you know his serve and his volleying skills. With uh, someone who serves that way, volleys that way. With just a little bit of work, they should be able to really help a college lineup when it comes to doubles. You mentioned he needs to play more basketball, three hours a day. Yeah, prescriptions for ever everyone. Um, you know, it's it's uh, a lot more than just having efficient strokes. I do think that uh, first impressions are everlasting, and when people come in, that's the first thing you know they remember. Uh, I actually saw. At the Battle of Boca, I didn't get a chance to talk to him, but I saw Junior Ore playing doubles. And that was, you know, story of circumstance. His grandfather, Eddie, Alex Vukovic, brought Junior to me. He was supposed to be there for four days. He stayed for four months. And, you know, he transitioned from really being a retriever. He you know, was always highly regarded as far as his foot speed. But, you know, just watching him play some doubles the other day, is that, gee, you know, just, does he really know the process? Does he really understand all the years go by? People need to study content. You're, you know, I like the idea where the, the coach is the compass and the player is the coach. You know, with the information, um, you know, we just went through a review session. And, again, it sounds so negative. A lot of times it can just be a sheep through the gate. I mean, there's a kid's brain switched on. I mean, look, you know, we film and look how you're hitting the ball. Now you just got to get super fit and then you need to be composed. You know, you don't need to have the approach shot turn into the anxiety shot. You know, can you just, you know, simply put some fundamental concepts together? Yeah, going back to what you said a minute ago, it really is more than efficient strokes. And I started to realize that more towards my last few weeks here. You know, the first six weeks, I was practicing really hard every day. And uh, uh, the latter six weeks, uh, I was doing a lot of work. But my tennis improved the last six weeks more than it did the first. And I think I put it together. You know, I'm working hard, you know, as an intern. And I'm working hard to play extra, uh, I hit extra tennis balls at nighttime. And it really, trans like, the life translated and the tennis tennis translated into life i really started to figure that out towards the end no i we always you know we say things so in a very strong way is that people don't know how to get better you know you keep telling them you're showing them and but also to the maturity 
obviously these podcasts are very repetitive, but the late Steve Johnson Sr. Tennis lets you know who you are. Fred Shiro, uh, former hockey coach. Tennis doesn't, or sport doesn't build character, it reveals character, but no maturity. I remember sitting on the bench with you and you said, I'm talking to you and you said, oh, can I go hit the backboard? And I said, well, it's, it's not going to make a difference. Why, would you, why do you want to go hit the backboard? I'm talking to you and, and you know, your response is, can I go hit the backboard? So you, you really need to be a deep thinker. You know, it's amazing. You just show kids the application, idea after idea. Go to the backboard, drop hit ball, drop hit a ball on the forehand side, just let it go by. Dick Braden used to always say that people just want to hit balls. Yeah, it's a 16 cents a shot. Like they, you know, the CPA, they have the, the accountant's mentality. They figure it out. I just got to hit more balls. I just got to hit more balls. And, um, no, for sure you have to put lots of reps in. But when it really comes right down to it, you know, science and logic. You know, a young guy who's very passionate. He's got one more year in high school. He does really well in the classroom. And, you know, he's reading about Djokovic. He's looking at YouTube clips. And I said, you know, we think it's very important to look at the, the film of the best players in the world. But you got to just go with science and logic. And, you know, you swing outside, inside. You know, you can't hit true top. You know, today we have a young boy who's back for the second time. And he's only 10, so but we give him the gear as he's past the halfway point to age 18. And... Um, I said, okay, I want, and everybody watches. It's on a clay court, older kid, hitting with a younger kid. Well, just hit a tabletop forehand, hit an underspin backhand, put the ball right on a dime. And if they miss, it's your fault. You know, we're, rally, we're watching this one young boy rally, and I said, okay, come on in. You have an open racket face in the backhand. You still have an open racket face in the backhand. Deuce, he's a, a right-handed player, so that means, well, in the deuce court, you won't be able to return serve. You won't be able to play an inside out backhand return. Uh, you know, you're not gonna be able to hit that down line backhand. But it's so important. But then you think, well, you know, then there's, so he, this is a 10 year old, there's another a nine year old, then we have the nine year old do it. And I say, well, she has better technique than you. But you just have to enter their world is that you just know the 10 year olds, the 10 year old boy's gonna beat the nine year old girl. Right and now. It, and right now, and it doesn't go beyond that. It's like, that's just, uh, you have to know how they're wired, how they're thinking. And you just, it's, it's, you know, so we have people, okay, let's do a stroke review. And it's like everyone is pretty much spot on and they, they have the skill down. But can they connect the dots? Can they, um, you know? And I think that's a sad thing. You know, you ask tennis students, can you put two and two together? And I think on the flip side of that is in the crazy wild, weird, wacky world of tennis teaching is two plus two equals whatever you want it to be. No, I like that question that you asked these kids here that, um, where will your tennis be one year down the road, two years down the road, three years down the road in comparison to the person on the other side of the net now. And, and, and just learning to compete. Um, you know, we have one boy who's off to Kalamazoo and another boy went to Europe and I said, you two guys, um, you're okay, you're not gonna play D4 tennis. And that's the inside joke, there is no D4. But I said, you're, you're really not on a path to play D1 tennis, and they were just shocked. And I said, no, let's we'll watch the film. I mean, you're moving so slow to the corner, and you're both hitting sliced forehands, and the ball's not even past this single sideline. So, so no, no, I mean, and again, Division Three is way underrated. That's how, that's how Division Three teams, for them, it would be on the men's side. But just how the one player in particular has reacted is like he is flying into the corners. He is into the corners. You got to move. Uh, so, yeah, I think that there's too, I think there's way too much cheerleading, way yeah. too much cheerleading instead of like here, this is what you have to do. Are you doing it? Um, and I do think that a lot of times um, the parents do so much for junior tennis players, is they have, have this built-in the junior built-in idea that everything's going to work out. Mom and dad will take care of everything. And I go, no, they can't. They, they, they just can't take care of you becoming a better tennis player. You know, Vic Braden, you know, it's um, number one is uh, take responsibility for yourself. Yeah, I think uh, for that kid we were talking about, 
the sliced forehands. That was a coaching moment for him. You know, I like to think, you know, throughout someone's stay here, at least something you, me, Coach Roberto says to them will stick. And, you know, when he saw another player hitting that same shot in the corner, you know, he's not moving his feet. I, I believe that really stuck with him. You know, Roberto has a, certainly a magic about him. We've known each other over 20 years. We coached day in and day out for 15. I don't think people have any idea how much he's been part of player development. You know, I think you coach from love, you coach from respect. For the most part, he, people would label that he's coaching from love. Laid back, easygoing. But no, he can growl like a bear. We have a book, um, Barry Hint wrote, Journey to the Truth. And there's a chapter on Roberto where he roars like a lion. You know, or, like, he's teaching kids how to play soccer. He's always talking about his, how they're just afraid to compete. With, but f yeah, so if you don't coach from love, you coach from respect. And you know, I just, I really do think it's not a matter of just trying to give a kid a knee jerk reaction. It's like, where is this all going? Where is this all going? Um, with, um, no, we, we saw some of the visiting players that played clay court 18s that we've known, you know, one boy in particular, we've known almost 10 years and still played much better in practice than he did in the tournament. Um, you know, and, you know, we're talking about somebody who's been recruited or been contacted by just about every college team. You want to get to the point where you practice like you play and play like you practice. Yeah, the, the same motor programming, stress without stress. Yeah, no, it's, um, yeah, it's just amazing. I think with uh, Malcolm Gladwell in the book Blink, he, uh, he spent time with Vic Braden, and Vic would say, no, he's going to double fault. You just know without knowing. But it's a pretty safe bet that you feed balls out of a basket and a kid can hit overheads. But as soon as it's a match, the lob goes up, he's going to miss because he doesn't, she doesn't have the experience hitting overheads in match play. You know, it's a, they're just, it's like, here it goes. And, you know, we do all the situational training where, okay, let's start a set where you just throw up a high defensive lob, play in overheads, and, and the point begins. Um, I think note taking, you know, it's um, it, the players are here with us, you know, not so for the on the average we have say 16 players, and I would say we're housing half of them, and the other half are with parents. But I don't really think that parent uh, the players are the parents perhaps perhaps probably maybe weak word that we need to tell the parents they need to write this down. It's my fault first, is we used to check a journal every day. You know, let's see your journal entry. And, you know, you just get beat up where they don't do it and they don't do it. Uh, but a junior should be able, a goal-oriented junior should be able to take a notebook, take their notes, but then have a journal and say, okay, I'm going to write down three things. And you could come back to it. So we just take, say, take a blank piece of paper and just go one, two, three. Um, but, you know, the, the problem with that is still the phone. Is still the phone. Thief of time. You know, that's one thing that we haven't done um, in, in some time, but in, in days gone by, uh, we control the cell phone. They can only have the cell phone for an hour at night. It's just amazing. Um, and, the, and the parents, um, they just don't, they're, for the most part, they're just, some are just not aware that, you know, you don't need to be texting your kid and asking them what they had for lunch. You know, it's just um, too much attention. And, and, and so sometimes where the kid ends up being high maintenance, you know, if, you, if we could tell you that your kid is low maintenance, that's an amazing compliment. But uh, the kid will be high maintenance because of the high level of contact via the telephone. That's another uh, thing that I've learned a lot about this summer is actually parenting. You know, how, how the kid will be on court you know how how he's par how he's parented will show through how he is on the court. You know if he's tense, you know uptight, loose, and can think for himself, independent, dependent. 
Yeah, no such thing as a dumb question, just a question asked by a dumb kid. So, you know, they come up to you the day before and go, I play tomorrow at 8 o'clock. Like, we, we know we're responsible for getting you there. You don't really have to tell us that you're playing tomorrow at 8 o'clock. And, you know, then if they say, for example, their, their match is not at 11, you want to get them out in the heat and humidity anyway. But, um, you know, the kid will just ask, um, hey, can I sleep in? I don't play till 11. They just look at it and go, dumb question. You know, it's, just, it's just not in the cards. We have, you know, some kids that are just going to be training and working on technique in the morning for four hours. And then there's a lunch break. So there's a lot of variables, a lot of variables. And, you know, most tennis kids are used to having their own chauffeur, chaperone, and... You know, so it's, um, and it's, it's not to beat them up, but there are too many tennis kids have no idea what it's like to be on a team. You know, they're not, you know, you know, selfish in a, in such a bad manner, but they're, they're, you know, there is a, a self-centeredness just based on how their day works. You know, they're just used to, you know, I'm going to, I'm not riding the bus. I'm, you know, the, my mom or dad are going to just cater to my every need with this tournament. You know, with a volunteer, if you want to get something done, yes, the busiest person you know. I'd say right now, Phil, around here, you're the busiest person. So that, that's, a, <laughs> that's a compliment. Thank you. Yeah, there's definitely a lot of things going on all at once. Um, you know, I keep a, I have to keep you know, notes going, uh, keep a sheet, you know, what's happening in a day. Like today, we had I think it was four or five kids coming from air, coming from different areas, coming, going. Airport day, you know, yeah. A lot of variables there, you know, video every day. And it's a lot, but, you know, you got to stay organized. And that's another thing that's improved over the last 12 weeks, organization. Well, yes and no. I mean, there's always, uh, oh, yeah. I always just think about, this, you know, Roberto, you know, <laughs> he's done from A to Z, but he pretty much is coaching. And with, you know, today checking out and checking in, uh, our kids uh, st stripping the bed, are they doing, the, doing their laundry, are they cleaning their room? And typically the answer is no, because we're, we're just, we're not on top of it uh, like we have been in the past. So no, things are, you know, definitely, um, you know, you've helped tremendously with organization, but um, that's where ideally, Someone like yourself, you're just you're growing in leaps and bounds, and you know I you know I think we could talk about okay you're going back to school you got to put all your energy going back to school but there's still some follow up things to do like okay notes you know it doesn't take much to send out a mass email and say you know just want to let you know that you still haven't submitted notes where to hear it's to forget it to write it down is remember it you know to do it over and over again. And it's really sad that, um, you know, we make these technical tapes and, you know, pre-post tapes and yet ask people to just send notes, you know, just logical sequential order, grip, swing, body. What do you have to be able to do? Going, um, going back on the uh, technical films, I actually was able to pull mine up from my first visit. It was just great to see how much, uh, how much I've changed. Well, documenting development, you know, to go back, and that's one thing too, is uh, is everybody's name, is the spelling correct, is the, the, the dates, you know, that's everything needs to be done um, properly in the beginning so you can go back and you can look. You know, the number one reason that we film people, you know, like say, oh, sentimental value or education, the number one reason we film people is that people aren't going to come back and go, you didn't help me with my game. You know, we always have, we come back to Vic Braden and Vic used to be in the back room and go, that kid's game, what game? He's got no game. And then I tell the story where I uh, did several traveling clinics with Vic. Um, I know Jeff Lewis sets them up. Um, and so that's where Vic saw our process where we, okay, we have a 25 shot scale test, a tiebreaker test. And, you know, we really let the parents know that your kid can't hit the broadside of a barn. You know, the whole basketball thing where um, if that kid was in a boat, 
he couldn't take the ball. If he was in the middle of the ocean in a rowboat, he couldn't take a ball and hit the ocean. And, you know, it's not a matter of, you know, being the bad finder and saying, okay, let's let these kids know. But the scary part is they're being compared to the person on the other side of the net. And they really overall lack, lack, lack ball striking skills. And then it's a crock where there's so many people out there that they're making up ball striking skills as they go along. And they're even sometimes de-emphasizing how important it, how, how, how it lacks in, in importance. With uh, what else you got? I know with our volunteer, this may be their shortest podcast, and you're the most charming guy. We should have you on the longest. <laughs> your mother did drop you on your head, though. Huh? <laughs> yeah. Adds to the charm. Adds to the charm. I like that. Um, no, going back. Um, to uh, the house, you know, you mentioned uh, everybody gets an hour on the phone at nighttime, you know, uh, keeping track of what's written in the notebooks. Um, this goes back to Memphis. I remember one night our bathroom trash can was overflowing, and uh, Coach Andy Fitzell walked in the room, freaked out, brought the trash can into the, that one uh, main room we, meet in, we met in at nighttime, and we were cleaning the bathroom the rest of the night. <laughs> See, I wouldn't know without you having said that, that, that you were lucky that you were there uh, when Andy was there. Um, with um, organization means graduation. It takes so much more time to be sloppy than be neat. You know, John Wooden, you know, if you don't do it now, you don't do it right the first time, when are you going to have time to do it again? But I do think also, too, is that some, you know, I think too many times it's like, well, it's somebody else's job. It's somebody else's job. And with, I always tell a story where I was with Dennis Vandermeer and it was raining and we went to Jenkins 115 and we had over a hundred students and I was trailing with, with Dennis and there was some McDonald's debris, some, some garbage. And I said, oh, excuse me. And I just ventured off the sidewalk and pick, picked up the, the garbage. And Dennis was going to talk about doubles. It rained, okay, we'll go talk about doubles. And um, it was something that was, I wish it was recorded. Is he, he went into the room and he just talked about work ethic. Um, yeah, we have had fun over the years. You know, you, have, you know, some kids, they, they, uh, they can't wipe peanut butter off a knife. You know, we have had kids point at a machine and go, what's that? What's a vacuum cleaner? You know, we had one kid vacuum sitting down. We had another kid take an entire roll of paper towels to clean a window. And then from there, tried to put all the paper towels down the toilet. Um, you know, you, you ask kids to pick up weeds. And, I mean, you can just tell they've never got their hands dirty. Um, so things know, like that just show, again, it shows the parenting. Yeah, I mean, I also think, too, it's situational. We're here in Florida. It's amazing. Everybody, um, for the most part, um, you know, kids in Florida is not like in the Northeast. You, when I grew up, uh, I mean, I was the youngest, so I didn't have anybody to hand the job down to, but I mean, it, I mowed a ton of lawn when I was a kid and, um, that's something that's gone away where even wealthy kids, when I was growing up, when they were turn 16, they'd get a, they'd get a summer job. And I know tennis, that's one thing that's unfortunate. It goes year round. You know, it's almost like there's no off season and there's tournaments, tournaments, tournaments. Uh, we, we've had some kids, we've, I think it's three, three for sure. That um, with uh, Santiago Garcia is a graduate of Air Force Academy. He's a, he's a pilot now. And uh, he's somebody who listened to me and he went and got a job at McDonald's. I mean, to really get your hands dirty. And, um, yeah, I, I think they have work bees. Yeah, you know, we, we do do that here. You know, I think one thing that's unfortunate in every summer varies a little bit. I mean, I go back 48 summers teaching tennis is um, every weekend's a tournament. The, the Battle Book, people are here for that tournament. They play every weekend. So it's almost like we, we need to take time. We need to really, we need to shut down on Wednesday 
at lunchtime, he said, okay, let's go clean. Let's, let's go get organized. Um, but then again, we're, we can't do that right now because maybe we have kids who are playing tournaments and they, they win or they lose and they come based on their schedule. So we're, we offer so much flexibility. We have somebody who might fly in on a Wednesday morning and we don't want to really stop on a Wednesday at lunchtime. I think it's been great that uh, energy makes energy that uh, you've been hitting balls every night. Hitting balls every night. I think another thing too is that you've been respect. You know, you've you've earned your stripes. I mean, you're highly respected within the, within the group. But at the same time, you know, again, it's not to be the bad cop. But how many people are in the group who are asking you if they can help you out? How many people in the group really know what you're doing? And your world has been different than theirs. I think that's where uh, you know you came in just to work as a player. And um, yeah, Roberto and I talked about it and said, you know, he would benefit so much if, you know, he, the, the second part of the summer, you know, he just works here. What else you got? Let's wrap this up here. Yeah, I'm just very thankful for that opportunity you both gave me this summer. And, uh, well, certainly um, we owe you a big thank you. I mean, any, everybody who was here um, certainly would, would say the same thing. And um, with, uh, yeah, I do, I do think that um, typically in tennis, I recommend that people don't work in tennis. So you obviously play high school tennis, you're playing college tennis. Because I tell people it's not a real job. Because typically, you just get a ball hopper, there's no orientation, and you go out, and you knock some balls around, you feed some balls, and... Um, you know, that's very common where the beginning players have the beginning teachers. And, uh, but, you know, I think another thing, too, you could comment on is we do have a small staff. So if we have, say, 16 players, there's a good chance that eight of them have been here for a long period of time. And some people have been here, they're back to visit, and they're, they come on a regular basis, and everyone can teach um, that doesn't mean that they are teaching the life skills necessarily. Like today, um, you know, I call everybody in, and our youngest player, <coughs> she goes on the court, and I call her a chatterbox, and you know, totally extroverted, and she'll talk to a telephone pole. And I said, not one person reprimands her. Not one person goes, time to go to work. Time to go to work. And... Um, you know, I think that's junior development. You have the, the choo-choo train, you know, the, the caboose, you know, that's early childhood development. But the 18s should be pulling the 16, 16s should be pulling the 14s. And I do think that's a problem in most junior development programs is that the 18-year-old can't even say hello to the 6-year-old. With uh, And, you know, we have one little boy who comes out. And what an athlete. plays soccer plays uh, basketball well. And his grandfather has really studied tennis. He studied what we've studied, but even, I mean, just loves the game. Um, so I point that out. Point that out is that, you know, because we have some kids that really, they have not played soccer. They have not played basketball. Tell us, I guess we touched upon this. Let's touch upon um, uh, the running, the boot camp, the track, the beach. What are your thoughts on that? Running. Uh, well, Coach Roberto says uh, the Spanish mentality is 50% tennis, 50% fitness. And, uh, you know, that's very true. You know, you got to be fit to be on the court all day. You got to have strokes that hold up under pressure. Um I do believe the track's very good. Everybody should know their mile times. What's your mile time? What's your best down here? My best here is 507. 507, that's stout. And, um, and that's with little sleep. <laughs> that's with very little sleep. With yeah. uh, but 507, with, that's something that you certainly could take back to your tennis team. Yeah. No, I, I think... Did you run in school? I mean, that didn't just come out of nowhere, right? 
Um, well, in middle school, I ran uh, on the track team. And high school, track and tennis were during the same season. So mostly during the winter times, I'd run outside a lot, get ready for the season, you know, do most of it on my own. And, um, you know, I always kept up on my fitness. You know, I, I enjoyed it. And, you know, like you say, you just do your routines until it's just a routine. And Well, yeah, I think no pain, no gain. I think a lot yeah. of times self one, self two, the good guy, the bad guy, Tim Galloway, the doer and the teller. The teller needs to shut up and just go. Yeah, and at the, in the end, at the end of the day, it's it's really what you put in, you'll get out, you know. So if one person is just pacing for the others during our uh, our lake runs, you know, why not push yourself, see what you can do? Yeah, no, I've, a lot of times when people will, it's amazing how they'll blurt things out. I'm a tennis player. I'm not a runner. And... <laughs> With, I tell my story about being a coward. I did so much distance. I've got bad advice. Ice hockey, well, just jog. And I lived on a lake and ran around the lake. And I was doing like 70 miles a week as a kid. And no speed work and no hills, no stairs. I would have done whatever I was told. But I was just said, oh, just go jog. And boom, boom. Similar. L L LSD, long, slow distance. But I can remember... Uh, having a coach, you know, I was, re you know, out of respectability, I was running um, as a freshman on the varsity. And um, he made me run a race twice and at the same time. He goes, Smith, you just bounced through that. But I can remember running with two guys that, you know, one's throwing up blood, the other one's delirious. And, um, but I could cruise. I mean, and, Plus, you know, you get to the point where you do enough running, you know your splits. And and, and uh, I remember uh, when I went out for college hockey, I was trying to put weight on in, in the wind on Lake Ontario. I did a 5.10, but um, Stevie Pelusi, who I grew up with, he ran a 5.02. But most kids uh, way back when uh, still struggle to get below a six-minute mile. And um, yeah, I remember breaking five minutes when I was 16 years old, but... Um, I never, I never really ran that much after um, my junior year in high school. But um, with yeah, Bruce Dern, you can't BS a stopwatch. You'd run ten miles a day. You when, mean, I, you when, I, when I was a kid, it was. Uh, you know, I think that helps me out to this day with uh, tenacity. Just like yeah, no, I'll just keep going and going and going. It was a, just kind of a novelty to you know, bug, bother, bugging my mother if I could just run around the lake, and. Um, but back in the day, um, you just didn't get the coaching that you do now. With, um, no, it was just sandlot sports, make your own fun. And the, the book, um, Range, the generalist is better than the specialist. That's one thing t with tennis kids. Um, I've said it before that I would like to be an athletic director at elementary school. It's okay, this is how we're going to go about it. And... Um, you know, Dan Nicole says that in his book, uh, you really, in the world of sports, people should be hiring 60 and 70 year olds because that's, you know, but typically, um, a 60 and 70 year old are not even can be considered for a job because kids have a very poor running technique. Uh, they can't throw, they can't catch. Um, you know, there's some camps that they're just electronic, they're just electronic, but no, it's good that you, uh, experience that we uh yeah i was with coach natalia and she actually mentioned uh my ru my running technique i i run a little flat on my feet and i really think it's you know from all the running i did in high school just jogging 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 you know i think i did so much of it that i you know like it became flat-footed andre agassi said he was clueless when he was 29 years old remember vince spadia won his first um Pro Turner was 29. He said that Spadia, or Spadia said that Agassi had really held him out. He said he was clueless until he was 29. But you you can read about, you know, and he, uh, Agassi did so well in the second part of his career, pro career. He did so well down under in Australia. But he had all sorts of backward, you know, running up hills. Um, yeah, run and run some more. You, it's, it's, it's movement. We say mechanics. It's your mind to learn mechanics, but then movement 
you know, and that your mind to, to have the guts, no guts, no glory. Um, you know, run, hit, compete. Yeah, we tell people you don't like to run, play golf. <laughs> but what else, Phil? Let's wrap this up here. I would talk a little bit about jobs. Jobs. Um, tennis jobs? Uh, well, well, Phil, jobs. if... Um, well, I'm from a tennis bubble. I mean, you know, I really am out of my realm if I talk about anything outside of tennis. But... <clears throat> You spent the last 12 weeks here. We met you before. Um, but if you want a job, just let me know. With, uh, <laughs> seriously, with, uh, I'm, I'm contacted all the time. And uh, right now there's a shortage of tennis pros. But if you could tell people that you did some hard yards here, not, not many people uh, would come through with the flying colors that you have this summer. But... Uh, you know, certainly I would recommend finishing your degree. My, my recommendation would be to work before you go to grad school. I know you've talked to me about grad school. There's no right or wrong with that. But I do think that people will ask you, how did you pay for your master's? And I think it's a good answer where you say, mom and dad didn't pay for it. Um, I have a son who his company uh, paid for his MBA, and it's a pretty simple formula if you get an A, Pretty sure that's how most it works most of the time. You get an A, the company pays for it. You get a B, you pay for it. Um, with, uh, I think tennis is a ticket. You know, if you wanted to work overseas, um, you know, there's there's things that you could be talking to me about for the following summer. Um, you know, this summer, you know, I had a property that was for sale, and and that's one of the reasons I stayed in Florida. Um, I think it's great to be in Florida with the heat, humidity. Years ago, the top U.S. Open participants would come to Florida and train. You know, Ivan Lendl, uh, who brought a new level of fitness to tennis. With, uh, but tennis is happening everywhere in the summer. You know, I think that uh, whether it's a matter of running a camp in the mountains or taking people to Europe. Um, so no, tennis is a ticket. You know, if you want to see the world, I do think. Um, you know, I saw told Raven Klassen that when he was a young guy and wasn't going to pursue college tennis, I said, we're going to make you a tennis teacher. And I think that everybody who plays should be able to say, I'm a tennis teacher. You know, the, the profession of, of teaching is, you know, the, the, one of the oldest and one of the most respected. Um, but everyone should be able to teach. Everyone should be a giver, not a taker, and give back. Um, but, no, tennis is a great way uh, people ask me why I didn't pursue a career in coaching hockey. At the time, it was very appealing to learn how to play tennis, but when I was a young kid, you could definitely plan on seeing the world through tennis, not through ice hockey. Ice hockey, now, when I was a kid, girls were just starting to play, and it was a sport that was, you know, it's exploded here in the U.S., but when I, when I played, it was, um, you know, just like from, from a, a bordering town to Canada where the hockey was only played in small pockets around the country, really. Potsdam. Mad stop, spelled backwards. Oh. <laughs> Potsdam, New York. Yeah. What else you got, Phil? Um, I think, uh, yeah, I, I really do think I worked hard this summer and I did have a lot, I enjoyed a lot of it. I had a lot of fun. And uh, previous no, I, jobs have helped me you know, develop a good work ethic. Tell us a little bit about the previous jobs you had. Oh, I, I, I'll go through them. So uh, I spent a couple summers at uh, Watchbox. They, they sell the most pre-owned watches in the world. And my first summer there, I was on the sales floor, just assisting the guys there, doing whatever they needed. And night times, I actually uh, had a job cl helping clean, out, uh, clean up the building. So I was a couple nights a week. I'd work on the cleaning crew. It was a couple hours every every um, few days, and I had another internship there the following summer in watch repair. So you know all the, all the cool watches would come through my desk. You know, I get to put them on, take pictures. And the following summer, that was uh, when uh, you know COVID came about. So I wanted to find a way to get out of the house and picked up a construction job resurfacing tennis courts. I did that for two summers. 
and uh you know it's hard work you know you're out in the sun from six in the morning to six seven at night you know on tennis courts or you know they also had another division for asphalt maintenance so say that again asphalt maintenance so you know seal coating driveways patching driveways different things like that and got your hands dirty oh yeah the comedian adam carolla if i'm pronouncing his name correctly he has a book out i haven't read it but i love the title everything reminds me of something when you mentioned watches i can remember working in the hamptons and this gentleman over and over and over again kept telling me i you need to buy an expensive watch and it's like no i got this ten dollar timex it works out fine <laughs> Uh, construction, I work construction. I can remember uh, my father as it was a civil engineer, and because of, you know everybody he knew, um, I rode my bike around the corner and with all these grown men, you know, and I was maybe your age, twenty years old, and I went right to the line and said, "I need to talk to so and so." And I was given a, a hard helmet and a flag, and I was flagging traffic. Talk about a clock going backwards. <laughs> so I'm out on the out on the road, and I'm stopping the cars with my hand, and I'm waving the people, waving the cars through <laughs> with the flag. And this engineer stops and says, "Hey, kid, let me uh, let me uh, show you how that works." And you stop them with a big orange flag, and you wave through your hand. <laughs> but there was a guy who was an undertaker, and I was out there, and it was just getting darker and darker and darker. And, and uh, his name was, I believe, Ed Walsh. He stops by and he, he calls me over. He's smoking a cigar. And he goes, hey, kid, do you have life insurance? <laughs> <laughs> because, you know, you're just out there. And here comes the bad weather. Um, but, uh, yeah, anything. And that's a great title. Everything reminds me of something. You get to be, I'm knocking on the door to be 70s, not too far away. And it's like, okay, I can tell some stories. With, uh, give us one more job you've had. Uh, I worked in the watch business, construction. You think, uh, you know, I picked up a lot of odd jobs for neighbors. Neighbors, that's family, good. Family, friends, so, you know, every year I pressure wash the house, mm -hmm. up my house, um, parents' home. I'll do that, the whole house, the driveway. I think for our listeners, that's a great exercise to ask kids, what jobs have you had? They kind of just look at you and they haven't had any. <laughs> I washed dogs. That was not my favorite. Um, I Tell people I was a grave digger. I actually worked at a cemetery. My grandfather, Mikhail, used to say, um, I had thousands of people working underneath me <laughs> with, uh, you know, painting a fence. People were dying to get in to his job. With, but it being a grave digger, you know, there was just occasionally where the backhoe couldn't get into a certain situation and you're, you're digging a grave. But I tell you what, you learn from every experience. I was... During those summers, I was at quite a few funerals, when, and it's just so different when the old are burying the young. You know, someone has had a full life, you know, they've lived, they're, they're in their 80s, and you're, at, you're just, you don't know anybody, but you're, you're at the gravesite, you know. Um, you know, you have to fill in, the, fill in the grave when everyone leaves. And, uh, but I, I would never forget being at a... Um, at a funeral where this young 19 year old passed away and it was like whoa what a difference there's a young canadian uh i think should be able to tell you from niagara falls bruno um he became number one in the ncas i remember working with him and um it was a motorcycle accident at a one-handed backhand his father was just emphatic about him going forward at such a young age he became number one in the ncas played at kentucky and uh you know he he was very, very young, and he'd been hired by Tennis Canada. And I don't think his, I think he was a baby boy. I don't think he was even one year old before he lost his life. Life is precious. Phil, it's been precious to have you here this summer. We have to connect. Maybe we can do something in the future. Um, anything to, any mind vitamin you want to end this with? I have two things. Um, two things. Two, two things. Don't get, don't get to... dropped in your head. <laughs> That's one of them. Uh, you know, making mistakes, that's the best way to learn. And, you know, here I've definitely made a lot of mistakes. Um, 
but you know, for the better, I've learned a lot here and, you know, it really helped me as a person. And yeah, if you, you make him, my mother, if you make a mistake and you don't correct it, you made a second mistake. Tennis is mistakes, Victoria, and tennis court's a mistake center. And um, like today, we started making post videos, my fault first. We filmed backwards. Yeah. And I just said, Phil, my mistake first. And then told everybody else. Everybody else came in and coach uh, Lorenzo from Italy. It my mistake first. I said, we're doing it backwards. We got to start it over. And we can't go, oh, it's okay. No, we got to do it. We got to do it from the top. But then I told the small group, <laughs> excuse me, <coughs> that's how it works. The leader has to say, my mistake. I made a mistake. We have to start again. And the tennis court is something you just say, yes, I don't know how to hit a second serve. I don't know how to rally. I get an approach shot and I just blast it out. And you, know, you um, have to know what your mistakes are. What else you got? So that's one. Taking opportunities. You know, uh, when an opportunity is presented to you, just take it, no matter what it is. And uh, this internship, that's definitely the one that I'm glad I took. Well, there was one thing where um, when we talked to you about it, you wanted to go home and then come back. And I said, well, the opportunity won't be there. With um, opportunity, how does it work? Is Luck is when preparation opportunity meet. You know, that's something with uh, Bill Gates. Uh, I think everybody has a list, but somewhere, someplace, we have Bill Gates' uh, list and, of uh, rules. And one is your parents uh, years ago or your grandparents, they looked at flipping hamburgers as an opportunity. And, you know, today some people look at that getting your hands dirty. It's just a downright burden. And um, anyway, the triplet. We met the best, right? We met the number one triplet. I'd say so. There you go. We'll have to get the other ones, other ones to chime in. But anyway, listeners, uh, we have to cut this one short. Of all the people, we should have the longest podcast with uh, Phil because, number one, he's just from New Jersey. But, Phil, thanks. And, listeners, I hope you got something out of it. Um, you know, someone wants to go, go through an internship. We have customized internships. I mean, somebody can come for, for four days, and it's much better if it's uh, – I'd say four months. I think that um, typically what happens is people get paid too much too soon. They start teaching, and they haven't done internships. They, ha they haven't, and I, I think that's something with young people today that they, they, with their fingertips, they can just kind of YouTube it, and, and they're not really uh, serving you know, under a mentor or a confidant. But uh, anyway, Phil, thank you very much. Thank Listeners, you. I hope you got something out of 104. We've got two years of podcasts in the book, in the books, and we uh, have intentions, plans to uh, continue to have more. So we hope that uh, it's helping out in at least some way. Thanks. Thanks, Phil. You wave by the camera, Phil.